These are amazing times. Uh, you know, on the one hand, you see what's going on in the world, and it can lead to despair, but there's a whole other story being written. And I'm so thrilled that the person bringing the sermon today uh, is able to be here with us. So I got to know Mark Clark about four or five years ago, and not only has he become a good, close, personal friend, but he's become a great friend of Connexus. He was here a couple years ago when we did the Problem of God series. If you're uh, intellectual, I think one of the unique things about the way God has wired Mark is you can see he's a lot of fun, he's got a lot of street smarts, but he's actually academically very solid and very in tune. He wrote, his first book is called The Problem of God, and we taught through it uh, and some of the principles in it a few years ago. It's definitely worth reading if you're skeptical and you have evidentiary questions about Jesus. Um, but Mark is one of those people that I think just once in a generation or so, God raises up some incredible voices. And uh, Mark is one of those voices. He leads uh, founding pastor and the lead pastor of Village Church in Vancouver, British Columbia. Six locations, about 6,000 people on the weekend. And uh, it's such a privilege to have our friend and my friend, Mark Clark, here this weekend to bring the message. So welcome him. Thank you, sir. Hey, come on. Bring it in. All right, good to have you. Uh, if you got a Bible, Luke 15. Um, the reality is, I, I mean, I love Connexus Church. I love what you guys are doing. It's actually world-class. Jeff and Carrie are both world-class. Your, your staff's world-class. And the vision of what you guys are doing is, is unbelievable. And I travel and got to speak at a lot of conferences and churches and stuff. And uh, what's going on here is pretty special. You're a pretty lucky, lucky crew uh, here in Barrie. I grew up in Ajax. I don't know, anybody know Ajax? Okay. <laughs> Then I moved to Vancouver, and uh, once you go to Vancouver, you just never come back here. So if you don't, if you want to see your kids and your grandkids, don't let them visit Vancouver, because it's pretty addictive. Anyways, uh, good to be with you guys. Uh, Luke 15. Here's a, here's a very interesting story Jesus tells. Probably the most famous story Jesus tells. It's been called the prodigal son story. It's not actually a great name for it, uh, because... Um, it's not about one lost son. It's about two lost sons. And these two lost sons are lost in two opposite ways. And the way that they're lost are both representative in this room or if you're watching online, uh, they make up two kinds of people. Uh, it basically deconstructs every way that humankind has ever come up with to connect with God. He tells a story and it blows all the paradigms up and says both of the ways that people have tried to get self-fulfillment, joy, connection with God, salvation, are wrong, there are two ways of being lost, and there's one way of being found. And so that's what this story does. So uh, we, we got to connect into it. We got to open ourselves up to go, which one am I in this story? So Luke chapter 15, it starts in verse 11. Uh, he says this, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. And so in that culture, this is like the, the son, it's very offensive, right? Because he's saying, you have money for me that's going to come to me when you die, and I want it now. So basically, uh, I wish you were dead now. So it'd be like walk, guys walking up to your grandparents and being like, hey, listen, I know you're giving me dough. Like, how you feeling? All right, time's ticking here. Like, I got to get a down payment for a house why are you feeling so good right now at 90? I mean, it's blowing my mind, right? So it's kind of like that. Like you're actually offending people when you ask them to give you the money that they're going to give you when they're dead. Now, especially in this culture, Middle Eastern culture, it would have been completely offensive. I know uh, a guy who actually went and shared this story in the jungles of the Philippines, and he was talking to this whole village, and there were all the elders of the village were seated up front, and he looked at them, and he said, what would you do if one of your sons came up to you and said, give me the money of my inheritance? And they all looked down kind of to the ground, and they were like, you know, didn't want to answer. He's like, no, what would you do? And one of them stood up, and he was standing there, and he had this stick, and he said, we'd beat him to death. Right? Right? Literally, that's what most cultures would do, is they would beat this kid to death. Right? Because what is this kid about? He's like, give me what I want now. And some of you are this kid. You look at God and you say, give me your stuff, but I don't want you. Give me health. Give me blessing. Give me gifts. Make my family all right. I'm not that interested in you, though. And so you're lost in a way where you don't know God. You're the irreligious kid in the story. So here's what he does. 
Um, so he distributed the assets to them. God the Father, in the story, gives the kid his money he's asking for, which is crazy. And one of the things I want you to do is actually love God, is actually know that he's so good, he's so loving, he's so beautiful. He actually gives you stuff you don't deserve. He's not dumb. He's not nearsighted. He's not like, okay, kid, take the money. I want you to like me. He's like, no, you know what? I know you're a disaster, and I'm going to give you this stuff anyway. Right? That's beautiful. That's your life, by the way. In case you're like, mm, you're a disaster. That's the first thing in the story, all right? And God let you wake up this morning. Like, the fact that you're alive, you should just be like, ah, right now. Like, it should blow your mind that God gave you another day, right? He let you live today. He put breath in your lungs. He decided not to kill you last night. Praise God. That's like issue number one, all right? You're alive. He gave you life, even though you're a disaster. Even though you're like, just give me health, give me money, let my family. But put it aside. he goes, you know what? I'm going to let you live another day. This is how good the father is. He's not dumb. He's good. This is who God is. And so this kid takes the money and he goes off. Not many days later, verse 13, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. So he goes off, he does whatever he wants, all right? He's the irreligious son. He's the secular son. He's the son who's that, and some of you are that. This was me growing up, all right? I grew up in an atheistic home. No, no church, no Bible, no, no anything, no God. Uh, my, fam, my father was ardently atheistic. He was against Christianity in every way, and I didn't ever want to come to a church uh, because I knew that the church would just, in my brain, a church. Like, I, I became a Christian when I was 17, 18, but I just sat around and read the Bible. I, I just smoked cigarettes and read the New Testament and be like, I need to follow Jesus and figure this life out. And I don't want to go to a church. And everyone kept inviting me to a church. I was like, I don't want to go to church because I know what church is going to be. All right, church is going to be, it's going to be orange shag carpet and smell like mothballs and it's going to be old and I don't want to do it. All right, and then I showed up to a church and it was exactly like that. All right, but there were pretty girls there, which is why I stayed. And then I married one of those girls. So, but this was my life growing up. Very atheistic. I'm, I'm, I'm a skeptic. I'm an evidential uh, who in this room is kind of more of like, a, like an evidential thinker? Like you don't believe stuff unless there's evidence, right? Yeah, it's like, you're like me. Like, like I'm not gonna believe you. I wanna see it with my own eyes, right? Um, uh, my, I have a 13-year-old daughter, an 11-year-old daughter, a 9-year-old daughter, uh, so you can pray for me. So we, uh, uh, when my daughter, like last year for the first time, like when your kid grows up, you're kind of with them all the time. And then they get to this age where all of a sudden they want to do this crazy thing, like live life without you there. And I'm like, that's not going to happen. So she was like, can I walk to the convenience store with my friend? And she's like 12 years old. I'm like, no, that's not a thing. I know there's guys in vans with like the circular bubble window that I don't want around you. So I'm like, no, that's not going to happen. So I'm going to actually, you know, so she went out the door to the convenience store with her friend. And I looked at my wife. I said, I'm going to follow them. Um, and she's like, no, you're not. If she ever found out that you followed uh, them, she would be so mad. You're not going to do that. You should not do that. And I'm like, <laughs> are you saying I should do it with the, with the head and then you're not? You're saying no because that sounds right. But you're, she's like, no, you should not do that. You should never do that. I'm like, okay, I'm really confused. I'm just going to go. So I went and I got in the car and I followed my daughter. I kept the distance. She never found out. Um, I kept my distance and I watched her and then literally like her friend and her at the convenience store and I'm sitting at like this pizza joint where I can see them like standing outside the convenience store and the guy's like, hey, are you going to order anything? I'm like, shut up, go away. I'm busy, right? And I'm zoned in because that's who I am. I don't believe anything unless I see it. So that was me growing up. So when a guy started telling me about Jesus, as an evidential thinker, I was like, well, I need to actually rationally believe this. And so I started studying the science of it. And I started realizing that philosophers all through time, scientists all through time, would say that anything that begins to exist has to have a cause, right? If any, it's called contingency. If anything begins to exist, it has to have a cause. Like you and I, we began to exist, right? You came into existence. Why? Because people who existed before you, one night, the mood struck them right, all right? They were getting along. The can, okay, don't think about that too long, all right? You're like, Bleh. Right, your parents. All right, but point is, is, is you came into existence. Why? Because people who lived before you had an action that created you. All right. So 
Anything that begins to exist has to have a cause. So for thousands of years, philosophers were like, well, what's the uncaused, non-contingent thing that exists? What's the thing that never had a beginning? What they would say was, well, that thing's the universe, right? You don't need God because the universe has always existed. Socrates, Plato, Aquinas, all these conversations were all about that. And then, and that was a legitimate argument. Everyone was debating that. And of course, until 1930s, when Edwin Hubble looked through his telescope and realized that all time, energy, matter had came into existence in a single moment. And he rewound the clock and he said, actually, everything that began to exist has to have a cause. The universe began to exist. We know when it began to exist. Ergo, the universe has to have a cause. It's not a non-contingent thing that exists into itself. And so you have to push it one step further and go, well, then who, what actually existed before? What created this? And then I started tracking down the philosophy. And I started to go, does it make rational sense to believe in God? And one of the things that bothered me as an atheist, and maybe this is some of you, or at least an agnostic, was that I had this problem of morality, that I knew things were right and things were wrong. I knew rape was wrong, murder was wrong, but I didn't have a good explanation why. Why did I know things were wrong? Why did I have an objective moral value? See, if an objective moral value exists, you have to have an objective moral value giver that told you, here's what's right, here's what's wrong. Murder's wrong. He built that into your, it's called a conscience. But where did that come from? It started to bother me. Now, our culture, of course, has shucked away this question by what? It pivots. And how does it pivot? It says there are no objective moral values. There's just what you believe. So you believe what you believe. I believe, don't bring your beliefs over to me. All right, you believe what you believe. I don't project your stuff on me. That's a burden, all right? If anybody does that, by the way, just, just punch them in the throat, all right? <laughs> because at that moment... What you'll be doing is, like, if, you, if someone goes, you know, objective moral values don't exist, morals are all subjective, punishments are all, and when they say, oh, why'd you do that? Go, dude, don't project your values on me, right? <laughs> why are you projecting what you believe on me? This is how I feel good in life. See, if anybody ever challenges you, ask, like, okay, do you, if you're someone who believes in pure moral subjectivity and you're here, and we have a ton of them at our church, one of the things I challenge them with is, okay, if you believe that, um, cutting in line, do you believe that's right and wrong? If you don't believe it, don't let anybody ever, someone cuts you off in the grocery store, I guarantee your existential philosophy falls apart quickly. We were in Disneyland a couple of years ago. I'm in a line two and a half hours, standing there with my family, and my, we're waiting to go on this ride, and this woman, after two hours, cuts in front of everybody in line, goes right to the front, and stops and stands there. And I'm a pretty kind of passive-aggressive Canadian, so I'm like whatever, bro, I don't even care. Like, I'm the kind of guy, like, I could order spaghetti and they could bring me steak and I'll just eat it. I'm just like, whatever, I don't want to bother them. Clearly they're busy, all right? So, but my wife ain't like that, all right? She's like, there's not enough salt content on this, by the way, and I need you to take it back and figure it out back there, all right? So, this lady gets jacked up. And so, so I know she ain't gonna let this die. I'm gonna let this die, I don't care. But this crowd starts to murmur, and they start to go, and all of a sudden, they elect my wife to deal with this, all right? So my wife's like, excuse me, did you just cut in line? And, and this lady pulls up beside this guy, and he's a Chinese guy, and he's sitting there, and he's looking down at his phone, and she pulls up beside him, and she goes, this is my husband. Now, she's hoping this guy doesn't speak a lick of English, all right? So he's on his phone, looks up in, in perfect English with no accent, goes, I don't know this woman, all right? <laughs> at which point, it was on. I mean, these people, my wife, it was like Beauty and the Beast. My wife was like, get the beast out of the line. I chucked him out of the line. It was crazy. So listen, you know people cutting into rape is wrong, murder is wrong, cutting in line. Why? And so you trace it back. C.S. Lewis said, as an atheist, this is one of his biggest problems. Why did I believe in morality? If I believed in morality, someone had to tell me what was right and wrong at some point. And then I started studying the Gospels. And I started realizing the Gospels 
where actually the Bible itself was legitimate. Some of you here, you're like, I don't want to believe in Christianity because I, I don't think the Bible's legit. I think that the early church got together and created a bunch of myths and stories and legends about Jesus, created stories about him walking on water, feeding 5,000 people. The Bible's made up. The early church just made it up. But as I sat and read the Gospels, I started to realize that none of that actually made any sense because there is so much counterproductive content in the Gospels that if you were creating a religion, you would never put it in there. The early church would never put in stories, for instance, about people walking up to Jesus and saying, hey, are you God? And him saying yes, and spending chapters and chapters explaining that he's God. And it's like, so you're God, yes. So you know everything, yes. You know every, every little detail of the universe, yes, I created it all. Okay, well, I have a question. When are you coming back? And he goes, I don't know. <laughs> why, why would you put that in there? Just take it out. Delete it. The, like like when, when Jesus walks into a village and he goes, he could not heal people there because they lacked faith. Don't put that in there. Just rip that out. When you get to the resurrection stories, Matthew says there's one angel. John says there's two. So which is it? Skeptics say, see, they made them up. No, secular scholars go, here's the problem. That's exactly what happens in ancient literature when people don't make it up because they didn't get in a room and say, Matthew, John, how many angels? Okay, we're making a story up. We're making up a religion. How many angels you got? Two, 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 two. Everyone say it together. Two, not one. Idiot. You wrote one, right? That, <laughs> that would happen if you made up a religion. But the gospels read... Like, they're just telling you what they saw and what they experienced. And they're not contradictions because Matthew's telling us that there were two and John's telling us there's one because he's only focused on the one that spoke. Matthew's worried about how many were there. So there's all these things that happen. So I started tracing this down. And I started realizing, man, this is actually legitimate. That the resurrection, when I read those narratives, actually happened. And I started studying the history and realizing that some people, skeptics, were saying, no, 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 Jesus didn't really raise from the dead. Here's what happened. Here's what the Islamic teaching is. Here's what Discovery Channel is. Here's the theory. Jesus never rose from the dead. Here's what happened. He went up on a cross. They crucified him, but he didn't die. What happened was he swooned. It's called the swoon theory. And then he came back and... And when I started studying history, I was like, man, that doesn't make any sense at all. Because the one thing the Roman Empire knows how to do was kill people, right? <laughs> they would literally crucify 6,000 guys on a single day. They didn't tend to like take a guy off a cross. Oh, is he dead? Yeah, Whew, throw him over here. It's like, whew, that was close, all right? <laughs> and just start walking around. I am risen. I am risen indeed. Start a religion from me. That's not what happened ever. So I started chasing these things down. And I started realizing, man, maybe Christianity is actually the best idea in the marketplace of ideas. And here's something that started to happen. I was this kid. I was the reckless one. I was the one doing everything that you do when you don't know Jesus in your life until I'm 18 years old and something happened to me, which was what happens to this guy and what needs to happen to some people here. After he'd spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. He gets humbled. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating. In Jewish culture, you didn't touch pigs. You didn't eat pig. Pigs were the most disgusting things you could ever have in a culture, and this guy's sleeping with them, and he's hoping that he can eat what pigs eat. This is the epitome of humility. And look what happens. Verse 18. I'll get up, go to my father and say to him, Father, now if you've got a Bible, underline this. I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Some of you need to hear that right now because you're walking in ego. You walk with a swagger. You think you're the center of the universe and you've got a culture afraid to tell you that you're actually not worthy. We have a culture that wants to look at you and say, you're so worthy. Look inside yourself. Find, you go to any bookstore. The biggest section in that bookstore is self-help. 
Self-actualization, find your number, find yourself, go inside, you're gonna save yourself because you're worthy, you're basically good. And this guy comes to a place where he goes, I'm a sinner. See, what happens in the church is we think we're so worthy that we begin to think that God owes us stuff. So think about the way that people talk about trying to discern things in life right? God needs to, so I, I did young adult ministry for six years. Do you know how often I would sit with young adults and they're like, you know what? God told me we're supposed to get married. And I'm like, dude, what? That's the fourth girl in the young adult group that God told you you're supposed to marry, right? That's not cool, but that's what happens. So we keep trying to listen and here's what we do. We think because we've been told we're special and we have a sense of entitlement, we think God owes us to tell us stuff. So we're discerning who to marry. And we're like, well, we hope that God's gonna tell, like, I, I don't know if I'm supposed to marry Sarah. I don't know whether I'm supposed to marry Lisa. And so you start praying to God going, Lisa or Sarah? And you're looking in your Alpha Gettys, hoping that Lisa gets spelt out. And you're like, oh my gosh, it's an L. I think it's an L. I don't know, I think it's an L, I think it's Lisa. And you're hoping he's gonna go, Sarah. When you're walking along the street, it's Sarah, marry Sarah. You're like, oh gosh, I got it. But he doesn't do that. That's not the way he works. There's a couple stories in the Bible where he works like that, but they're probably more descriptive than prescriptive for the way that, see, we think he works like that because we're in a generation that thinks he owes to tell us everything. What the Bible says is, whoever you marry, serve and lead her like Christ served the church. That's the will of God for your life. That's what he does. And so often we want to, and see, here's what's good about that, that God's in control and you're not. Isn't that beautiful? Like, just feel the freedom of that. It's like, ah, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. You know that, right? You're not perfect. That means in your marriage, you don't have to be perfect. It means you don't know what's going to happen. It means, it means God's not going to give you the kind of control you want. He's not going to give you the kind of power you want. And you know why that's good? Because remember the girl you wanted to marry in junior high? And you were like, please, Lord, I will literally do anything. I will do anything if you let me marry that girl. And then that didn't happen. And you've seen her on Facebook over the last couple of years. And you're like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that I, for unanswered prayers. You are the greatest. It's a very good thing that you are not in control. So here's what's gonna happen to us when we give up the reality of feeling worthy. We're gonna be humbled. We're gonna be humbled. That's what you need. I, I, let me give you a word picture for humility that I experienced a couple months ago. It was Christmas Eve. Uh, pastors experience two great days a year. Okay, I mean, we have other great days a year. It's not that depressing of a job, but two great days a year. What do you think the two best year, days of the year are for a pastor? Christmas and Easter, super bowls of a pastor's life. All right, the church doubles in size. Everybody shows up, just get, just get me my seat. I wanna come out and hear about your programs. I wanna, you know, whatever. And so a pastor gets everything slick and ready. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. We're gonna wow them, they're gonna, we're gonna save everybody. They're gonna legit. So... Every single year this happens at our church. It just goes, whoop. everyone shows up dressed to nice. So I always dress up. I got, I got a suit. I wear it twice a year. Really nice suit, $120 at H&M. Nice suit, got a, got a tie. All right, and I get up and I preach. And this past Christmas Eve, I just slayed it. Best Christmas Eve service best Christmas Eve sermon. I got six of them to preach. I'm preaching. I got baby Yoda involved. The kids are loving it. It was legit. It was like, Jesus is the true and better baby Yoda. All right, we got lots going on. People were, they were like, Mark, this is the greatest sermon I've ever heard in my life. My whole family came. Everyone came to Christ. It's crazy. There's a renewal. There's a revival in our city. This is nuts. This is the greatest. It was apex for me. I was like walking with a swagger, man. I was like, this is legit. And then I left. And my wife said, we're going to a Christmas party tonight. But the theme of the Christmas party is everybody's got to wear their onesie, their PJs. It's interesting because I see people walking around their PJs today. And I guess that's like a theme. I, I assume it's a theme just today. All right, it's not like when we were in Walmart the other day, half the people had their PJs on. But um, uh, I assume that's just a thing. I wasn't going to say anything, but I realized it's kind of a kids ministry thing. But anyways, so you're fine. You look great. So uh, anyways, 
So, so uh, we had to wear, we had to wear our, uh, we had to wear our onesie. Now, now, my family got me a onesie a couple years ago. It's got the buttons down the front, the little, like the, the patch, the flap in the back. All right, I'm like, whatever. So anyway, I put on this onesie and it's uh, inappropriately small. Let's just put it that way, okay? It's not probably something you should be wearing as a man <laughs> out in public, okay? Um, so I said, well, this is inappropriately small. Um, uh, so I put shorts on over the top of it, these big blue shorts to be more appropriate. And my daughters were like, those shorts look ridiculous. Take them off, stick with the onesie. So I'm like, all right, fine, boom. So I took my shorts off and I go to this party in a onesie. Red Christmas onesie, okay? Inappropriately small. So I'm walking up to the front door of this party. Okay, there's like 50 people invited to this party. And, I, and this is not a joke. I look in the window and everyone's in there. There's 50, 60 year olds, 22 year olds, 40 year olds, dressed to the nines. <laughs> Sipping their wine, eating their cheese, talking about life and all the issues of the universe together. And I like walk up, I'm like, what is going on right now? And I look to my wife, I'm like, what, what, what happened? And she's like, oh my goodness. And she scrolls through her thing. And they, she misread the text. The text was, we're gonna have a party Christmas Eve. Make sure you wear your best. Don't wear a onesie. Ha ha. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I literally stood at a Christmas party for three hours in a onesie talking to people. I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah, how are you? Yeah, it's good. <laughs> this is not a joke. This is actually my life. Point being, by the way, it's a metaphor. I went from the height of ego to the biggest loser in town in an hour, right? That is the only way this guy gets saved. He comes to a place where he goes, I have nothing. I have no ego. I have nothing. I got no swagger left. I am in the basement. I, have, I can't earn my salvation anymore. I can't self-actualize. I am unworthy. And I need you to show up, Lord. I need you to do something in my life. And so here's what happens. He says, I'm no longer worthy. So he got up and he went to his father. And while the son was still, look, look at how beautiful this is. Listen to me. This is what I need you to grab a hold of in your heart. While the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with anger, beat him to death, compassion, and his father saw him, he was filled with compassion, he ran, and he threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and in your sight, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe, which would have been the father's own robe, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. Let's take my greatest possession, and let's kill it. This is the gospel. This is about God himself taking the greatest thing that he loves, his own son, and sending it down to be slaughtered so that lost wayward people like you can be found. And so he says, slaughter the calf, right? He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. This is how we need to come to terms with our own. We're broken, we're unworthy, and so we say, Father, can you please forgive me? And what you get is a God that is so good, he actually starts to run towards you. He doesn't even wait for you to get all the way to him. Is that not brilliant? He should have just moved on. He should have just built his business, forgot about this dumb son who took all his money. He should have beat him to death. And instead of that, he sees him like he's, it's almost like he's waiting for him. And the minute he sees his head coming up over the hill, he shoots for him and he kisses him and he grabs him and he puts his own robe on him and he takes the one fattened calf that they get all year and he slaughters it and he throws a party for him. This is the God who pursues you even though you don't even think about him. This is the God that gives you grace even though you don't deserve it. This is the God who hunts you down. I'll give you a, a, an illustration of this from my, are there any golfers in the room? All right, golf. I love golf, okay? The kind of thing I do. Vancouver, it rains a lot, so my buddy owns a place in Phoenix. So one day he goes, listen, let's go down. Me, you, and our buddy, we'll go down to Phoenix. So we go down to Phoenix and play golf. We show up at this golf course. They say, you need to have a fourth player. We're like, no, we just want the three of us. We don't want to meet some guy we don't know. So like, nope, you got to play. So this guy walks up. His name was Ethan. Hey, guys, I want to play. I'm like, oh, here we go. So I get in the cart with Ethan. I'm a pastor, but the one thing I don't like is people. All right, so, uh, 
So, so, so Ethan and I start rolling around this golf course. About the whole three or four, Ethan goes, what do you do for a living? I go, oh, I'm a pastor. You're a pastor. Yeah. He's like, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in church. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in any of this stuff. It's all a gong show. It's all a nightmare. It's all a mess. I don't believe in the existence of God. There's nothing I've done in life that has ever shown me the existence of God. I would never believe in that. I said, okay, well, here we go. All right, we got 18 holes together, brother. And so we start to chat about the existence of God. I'm like, don't you ever see the little things that he does in life where he speaks to you and he gets your attention? He goes, that's never happened to me. I said, it's never happened to you. I said, dude, it will happen to you. Believe me, you ask for it. God will start to show up and it's up to you to actually interpret it right and actually follow the grace of God in your life because he will show up. And he's like, no, not going to happen. Literally, two holes later, I hit a golf shot. Now, I usually hit it dead down the center, about 290, 300, 320. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I hit this one particular ball, weird enough, I, I, I sliced it way out into the desert, all right? Okay, it doesn't usually happen, but it happened. So I walked over, and there's this little bush in the middle of the desert, if you ever played golf in Phoenix, it's like this just sand, and I go in thinking it's my ball, and I pull out a ball, and I'm not joking you, the ball on it has written in, in black Sharpie, sweet baby Jesus. <laughs> right? That's what I said. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I go, huh, this is weird. In the middle of the desert, statistically speaking, how did I find the one ball that has the very Jesus that I've been speaking to this man about? The whole, and now it's buried in a bush, and of all the bushes and all the deserts of all the world, I walk up and I find this. Two minutes after talking to this guy about evidence, he's got to watch for evidence. God's going to hunt him down. So I grabbed sweet baby Jesus. I said, Ethan, look. He's like, what? I throw him the ball. He reads it. He's like, did you just write that on there? I'm like, no. He's like, that's weird. I've never seen that in my life. I'm like, I know, it's crazy. So I tee it up. Next hole. Whoom. Guess I was having a bad day. I hooked it. <laughs> okay, doesn't normally happen. Hooked it way out of bounds. 50 yards left, like gonzo. Hits a rock. Bounces a hundred feet in the air and lands dead middle of the fairway. Ethan's like, I have never in my life seen that. And I'm like, sweet baby Jesus. What? What? He is on my side, bro. How can you not believe he exists? I get up to the ball. It's the middle of the fairway. I got 150 yards into the hole. Get out my eight iron. Whew. Some reason, again, don't know why, slices off. Okay, it's having a bad day. All these are facts. 30 yards out into the desert. Hits a rock. This is no joke. Bounces directly into the middle of the fairway, like five, 10 yards short of the green. The guy's like, what is happening right now? We've never seen this. This is insane. He's like, never in my life have I hit a ball OB in the desert and it's come back into play, let alone twice. And I said, sweet baby Jesus, right? And he's like, this is nuts. This is crazy. So next hole. Get up to a par three. My buddy Lou gets to the tee. There's a big pond and he pulls the ball into the pond. And I said, Lou, sweet baby Jesus. And he teased, that was a 220 yard shot, there's water everywhere. He's got this big hybrid club and he's like, do you trust me with this? I'm like, I trust you with this. And Ethan says, if this ball goes in the hole, I will convert. <laughs> and then I'm just like, Jesus, Lord, Father. <laughs> I just start to pray, right? And Lou's up and he starts to shake, right? <laughs> this guy's entire eternal existence is at stake. And uh, Lou, who's, you know, one of the worst golfers in the greater Vancouver area, hits, hits a ball. I've never seen him pure a shot like this. Starts to curve in toward the green. Flags over here. Hits the green 10 feet from the green and starts to roll toward the hole. Nine feet. Eight feet. Five feet. Tracking, like right at it. Six feet. Two feet one foot. I'm like, oh my gosh, the angels are about to rejoice. This is going to be legit. <laughs> <laughs> the 
the ball goes, rolls by the hole inches and stops a foot from the hole. At which point, Ethan just throws his club in there. He goes, oh my gosh, I'm, I, I, I'm gonna become a like, I can't, what just happened? He's like, he's seen Lou golf all day. Lou is <laughs> everywhere all over the golf course. This guy almost dunked it. I'm like, how can you not believe, Ethan? How can you not believe? This is God hunting you down, right? Now, you guys see stuff in your life every day. The problem is, you don't interpret it as the existence of God. This younger son, you come up with all kinds of reasons why it's not that, and it's not that, and it's not that. God shows up in the little things. God shows up the day that he told me to go knock on a woman's door that goes to our church. And again, I didn't really want to because I like footnotes rather than people because footnotes don't send dumb emails. You know, I don't like your music. <laughs> so it's like... <laughs> I'm like, I don't, I just want to read books. I don't want to deal with people. And this pastor friend of mine is like, I was praying today in my office and you have to go visit this woman at her house today, right now. The Holy Spirit, this is true story. The Holy Spirit told me to tell you to go visit her. And I'm like, I don't want to. I'll go tomorrow. I got stuff to do. He's like, no, he told me specifically. It's got to be today, now. I'm like, okay. I get in my car. I drive to her house. I knock on her door. It's one o'clock in the afternoon. I stand there and wait. She answers the door. She's about a 65-year-old lady. She's in her PJs. She said, How, what do you want? I'm like, well, I just, I'm you know, one of the pastors at your church. Yeah, I know. Okay, so I came to visit you. Oh, okay. I come into her house. She makes me tea. We sit, we sit there for three hours chatting. We kind of become buddies over the course of three hours. And I go to walk out of her house. I pray for her. I go to leave. She looks at me. She says, do you know why I'm sitting here in my pajamas at one o'clock in the afternoon? It's not because I was serving at Connexus Church. It's because... <laughs> I'll tell you why. Because the last two weeks of my life have been the most dreadful, depressing weeks. Something terrible happened to me. And I walked down the stairs this morning and I walked into the kitchen and I said to myself, Lord, today I am going to end my own life unless you send somebody to the door to encourage me. And I fell asleep on my couch in my pajamas and woke up to the sound of you knocking on my door. And you don't believe in God. He shows up. The question is, do you listen? Do you follow the evidence where it's actually leading you? Or are you so worthy in yourself that you don't follow him where he's going? Now, that's the lost son moving toward the father who accepts him based on the work of sending his own fat and calf and slaughtering it. And there's a celebration and there's salvation and it's beautiful. But that's only half of the story because there's another way to be lost, which is probably actually more popular in this room. And it's the older son, which we forget about because the younger son, that's the great story. It's like you were out and you were all secular and atheist and you were doing bad things, but then you became a Christian and everything's great. Here's the other son though, the older son. Verse 25, now his older son was in the field and he came near the house. He heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants questioning what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him. Your father's slotting the fattened calf, slot the fattened calf because he is him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, look, I've been slaving many years for you and I have never disobeyed your orders. I go to church every week. I give money to the church. I love worship music. I listen to it in my car. I read Oswald Chambers. I don't listen to rated R, uh, watch rated R movies or listen to rated R music, explicit music. I'm a good woman. I'm a good man. I'm not like those people. That's what he just said. I've been with you. This guy went off and spent your money. Look what he says. Um, so that I could celebrate. But when this son of yours came, verse 30, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, all those people out there, they're so bad, aren't they? But we in here, man, we're not like them. We're righteous. And the tragedy of this story is, it's the older son who's lost at the end of it. It's the righteous, church-going, Bible-reading person who's always been close to the Father and never disobeyed. You know, it's fascinating 
because here's the problem. You start, I've never, I've never done what he did. Here's the problem. You start to compare yourself to other people, right? And so the problem with comparing yourself to other people is you can always find people worse than you. The whole milieu of a, of a Canadian culture, their salvation paradigm is I'm going to heaven. And when I ask them why, they say, because I'm not Hitler. That's what they believe. They deserve to go there. Problem is you can, comparison, look, look here's what matters. Romans 3 says, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of who? God, not other people. See, here's the problem. It matters who you're in the ring with, right? Like I've gotten two fights in my life. One of them was with a guy named Kevin, okay? Kevin gave me four punches to the face and I was out. I was like, wow, fighting's not fun. (laughs) The second fight I got in, I won. It was like two, three punches, a kick, a choke drop, down, boom, beautiful. It was my cousin, Cheryl. (laughs) No joke. And I felt good. I was like, I'm the man. Because it matters who you're in the ring with. Who are you comparing yourself to? You compare yourself to people, you're gonna feel really righteous and really good about your life. The problem is you don't get to do that. Your righteousness gets compared to God himself, which means you're lost, but you're lost not the way the first son is. You're lost in your own religion. You're lost in your own self-righteousness. You're playing a game. You act like you know him but you don't really know him. You just look like it and sound like it. You dress the right way, you talk the right way, you vote the right way, and you hang out with people just like you. And the problem is, those people are lost in the end. They're not in heaven. They're not celebrating. It's dangerous. It's insidious. It's, it's okay. So my buddy, we're in our first uh, year of Bible college. And he says, hey, I got asked to go on a television show. Would you like to come on the television show with me? It's a Christian television show where we get to talk about stuff. I'm like, cool, that sounds like fun. He's like, okay, I'll pick you up. It's next week, it's on prayer. And I'm like, oh my gosh. All right, prayer, what am I gonna say about prayer? Like, you know, so I read this book on prayer and there was this line that came out of the book and it said, prayer is not only talking, but it's listening. And I'm like, oh, that's good, that sounds nice. I'll say it in a nice pear-shaped tone. It's not only talking, but it's listening. And I had it all like sussed out as legit. So he picks me up and we start to drive to this, this, uh, this television station. And uh, we get in the car. He said, what are you going to say when you get there? And I'm like, well, I'm going to say the prayer is not only talking, <laughs> but it's listening. And he's, uh, he's like, oh, that's good. What? I said, what are you going to say? He's like, I don't know. And, and this guy's a little shrewd. All right. He's shrewd as serpent. All right, innocent as a dove, but he was a little shrewd. Like he's, uh, do you guys know the Burgers Priest? Have you ever heard of the Burgers Priest restaurant? Okay, it's him, it's the Burgers Priest, okay? That was my best buddy in school, Sean. He's the guy who started that. Okay, so he's the guy who says, we should go to a TV show, we should go. And I go, okay, you know. And we, we all knew he wouldn't end up being a pastor because the way this guy thought was vastly different than everybody else in Bible college. Right, he would figure out, like he went into a grocery store one day and he saw that there were free movie passes on the front of cereal boxes. He did the math and when uh, movies are 13 bucks a pop, the cereal box is four bucks and he bought out every grocery store that he knew, cut out every cereal box ticket, sold them for $10 a pop at the front of movie theaters. Everyone was saving three bucks. He was making six bucks a box. He became rich. He had people working for him. Layers of people. So you wonder why that's not happening anymore on your cereal boxes? It's because of Shant, the burger's priest. All right, so anyways, that's an aside. (laughs) Okay, so he says, let's go to this television show. So we show up to this television show and, and no joke, they put the makeup on, they start the lights, they start the camera and they say, what do you think about prayer, Shant? And he looks right in the camera and he says, well, I think prayer is not only talking, but listening. And then you see him dart his eyes at me and then look back at the camera. And I'm like, all right, and I got nothing now. And so they said, oh, what do you think about prayer? And I'm like, what? And I was about to murder someone on national television. Like, no joke. So I had read this other line in the book that said, 
You know, skeptics think that prayer uh, is just a coincidence, like answers to prayers, but isn't it funny that more coincidences happen when you pray? And so I said that, and everyone just kind of looked at me and went, yeah, interesting. Anyway, I moved on, and I was like, what? That was gold. What's wrong with these people? So we get in the car, and we're driving home, and Sean starts to go, hey, man. And I said, dude, don't even talk to me. We're not friends anymore. I don't like you. You stole my stuff. He goes, I'm sorry. I got stuck in a spot. I didn't know what to say. And I said, dude. And then he says to me, what was that whole thing you went on a rant on with coincidences? I'm like, I didn't say coincidences, you idiot. I, or I, I, I'm like, yeah, coincidences. He goes, no, you didn't say coincidences. You said consequences. I said, I didn't say consequences, dummy. That wouldn't make any sense. He's like, I know. It was really weird. You said consequences a lot. No one knew what you're talking about. I said, no, I didn't. He goes, well, we have the tape. We can watch it when we get back to my house. So we get back to his house. We pull the VHS, like the old school, like stick it in a machine, like hit play. So we stick this thing in the machine and no joke, on ca- I just look at the camera like, you know, there's consequences in life and sometimes there's consequences, but when God gets involved, consequences have consequences with consequences. And everyone's just like, yeah, all right, moving on. Anyway, no idea what I'm talking about. Why? How sick is it that I had to pretend I had a prayer life by taking lines from a book and playing a game? You know why? Because it wasn't from my affections. I didn't have a prayer life. I was, I was, I was putting a show on, which is what some of you do every day. You don't actually know him. You know about him. You know how to play the game. But pushed up against the wall in the dark when no one's looking, you don't love him. You don't treasure him above everything. You take Jesus as Lord and Savior because you want to get your sins forgiven and you want to get out of hell. What you don't take him as is treasure. And you know what the problem with that is? I am... Um, Went and spoke in an apologetics conference recently. They said, come down and convince our people that the resurrection actually happened. So there's 5,000 people in a room, and I just went through all this data on the resurrection and why the early church and blah, blah, blah. And by the end, everyone's like, yes. And I'm like, do you believe the resurrection happened? Yes, we believe it. You believe Jesus really historically rose from the dead, that Christianity is not principles and religion and philosophy and enlightenment. It's based on historical mind. Everyone's like, yes, legit. They're on their feet. They're jacked. And then I went, here's the problem. Satan believes Jesus rose from the dead too, and it doesn't save him. You know why? Because he doesn't treasure it above every other truth in the universe. He doesn't trust to it. He doesn't love it. He doesn't base his life on it, which is the problem with the older brothers in this room. You know stuff, but you don't trust to it. You don't treasure it above your money. You don't treasure it above your cottage or your family or your sex life or the way that you organize your work or success or reputation. You don't trust it above everything else. And here's the beauty of what the gospel does. You get the righteousness of Jesus put on you and then everything begins to change about your identity. You get to actually know that you don't, you know what the biggest toxic reality is to your contentment in life? Comparison. You compare yourself to other people. You scroll through Instagram, you're like, I want that husband. He makes more money than my husband. It seems like they're in Hawaii at least every three months. I haven't been to Hawaii um, ever. What's up, Tom? What's up, bro? And then Tom's like, you know what, whatever. I wish I had that guy's life. I wish I had this, I wish I, people do it in ministry all the time, I wish I had that church, I wish I, had we, um, Carrie and I know this, uh, this guy, Chris, and he speaks at these conferences, and he's down at these pastors' conferences, and he has this ability to like, pull everybody in to like his, like he's, he's a great communicator. He does like these first person, like, I f- smelt the dust in my nose, and I held the jawbone of a donkey as I slain the thousands as blood dripped from my breastplate. You know, and you're like, (gasps) and you're like totally in. For 40 minutes, he will capture an audience by doing first-person narrative, and he'll do it with 5,000 pastors in the room, and then here's the problem. All these pastors go home, and they try to do this, and they hack it. Right, you have been in that Christmas service, right? Where the pastor gets up, he's like, I have seen a star in the east, come with me. And you're like, what? 
I brought my friend for the first time. Now you're a time traveling shepherd. I don't even know what's going on right now, man. <laughs> Easter. Johanna, he is risen. Come, come with me, Johanna. What? <laughs> right? Why do they do that? Why do pastors do that? Because they want to be Chris. But they're not. And this is what you do every day. You compare and compare and compare. I want their life. I want that money. I want that satisfaction. And the gospel comes along and goes, no, no, no. You get the righteousness of Jesus put on you. You get the robe of the Father put on you. So in the end, when you're standing in judgment, you can either say, I'm going to base this judgment on my performance or you can say, I'm going to base this judgment on Jesus' performance for me. Look at me through all the things I've succeeded at in life. Or look at me through all the things that Jesus has accomplished in his life. And I'm going to take this one. And there's religious people in here that need to give up the self-righteousness and trust to the righteousness of Jesus instead. So, Father, we pray that this parable would create a, a scandal in the hearts of both of these sons, the irreligious one who has run far from you and the one who's never known anything other than a life of Christianity and church life, I pray we would feel and understand that both of these people are lost and that we would find the grace of the Father in the sacrifice of the Son and in the power of the Spirit. We would repent of sin and trust to the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. It is a truth that Jesus, you died on a cross taking on the wrath of God. You died for our sin. You died because of us. You died instead of us. And I pray that reality, the beauty of a good father, who runs toward us would actually melt the affections of our heart that we would begin to understand that where the gospel changes us is not in what we do, but it gets into what we want to do. And that's why we end up being transformed for your glory and the good of people. And I pray that's true about this church, about the individuals that make it up. Jesus, let us live for what you've given us to do, to tell this story first to our own heart then to the hearts of the people we know because time is short and this is the mission you've given us. In Jesus' good name we pray.